And then lastly, uh, last week I had someone come up and talk to me a little bit more about uh, laying out the growth groups stuff. And so I wrote something that was in the newsletter that was sent out this week. And yes, it's kind of wordy, but I'm going to read it. I felt compelled this morning to read this as to part of the reason why I believe the growth groups are such an important, small groups, whatever you want to call them, are so important in the life of a church. We've been called as a body of Christ to participate in God's building of the church. Our part is fulfilled in many ways. We serve one another through the spiritual gifts that we have been given. We pray with and for one another. We care for one another's physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. We fellowship together as we learn through close relationships how to love one another well. We are to encourage one another in their journey. We celebrate with and mourn with those around us. We listen to one another and correct, rebuke, and exhort one another from a place of humility and love. We study the word together. It is sharing resources, breaking bread together, and worshiping together. We sharpen one another, we grow together, and we train and refine one another for personal ministry. In essence, we do life together. Now, Sunday morning services are great, and they play a role in this. And this is, as we all know, it's a place to gather corporately to worship God, to come back together to fellowship, to reconvene with the saints. But it is not laid out in a way that does, that fulfills a lot of these one another commands that I wrote about here, but they are biblical, scriptural one another commands. That we are to live out on a regular basis with one another. So we can draw some of this from Acts chapter 2. Now given the difference in our culture and first century AD, you may find we actually have to work harder to develop intentionally these relationships because we live in a very individualistic, busy, scheduled life. We fill our times with activity and we don't often leave a lot of time for others. But we need to prioritize, prioritize both our faith and our children's faith. Now there are two ways that have shown themselves to be true about the best way to grow as disciples, to raise up leaders, to raise up disciple makers. If you look at Matthew chapter 28, our vision, we are to be disciples who build up disciple makers. The first method is one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Now this is an aside, but it's important. I wanted to state this. Where two men or two women get together and do the things that I described at the beginning. It's an opportunity for people to be vulnerable, to study uh, and, and become deep, and build these deep, lifelong relationships with one another. It gives us connection to the individuals in this church, just as Sunday gives us the connection to the body of the church. So one-on-one -on -one discipleship is important. It is, a, it is really a lifeblood of the church. But secondly, my focus is on the small groups. I told you I'm calling them growth groups. My reason for that is I want you to understand these are not groups designed to just hang out with for the rest of your spiritual life. They are to grow with in the desire that we are to be raised up, to be trained up, to go out and share Christ likewise in these one-on-one -on -one relationships, in these small group settings. But I was thinking about this a lot this week after this comment was made to me. And small groups provide a safe testing ground to deal with the good and the hard parts of interpersonal relationships. Interpersonal relationships are difficult. Marriages are difficult. Dealing with friends is difficult. Dealing with those who we just come into in the marketplace or in life is difficult. But it's also to help equip and build up one another with this goal, this great commission that God gave each one of us. And we know that there's a level of intimacy and interconnectedness that we do not find on Sunday mornings. It is impossible to recreate that just in this setting alone. Additionally, being a part of a small group provides us an opportunity to train in a variety of things. 
You've heard me make an emphasis of this on Sunday mornings as it is, the importance of being able to and doing and sharing one's testimony. As you meet with these groups, as you pray over and consider being a part of this, I want you to know that one of my visions for this is that you will develop, if you haven't, and practice with your group what your testimony is. Are you prepared if someone were to come up to you today and say, what, is, what has God done for you? Are you prepared? Are you always prepared to give a reason for the hope that lives within you? So an opportunity to do so. An opportunity to, to really understand what it means to share the gospel. If someone comes to you right outside the door this morning, you're leaving and someone happens to show up and they ask you, they ask you about something in life, are you prepared to give them the gospel message? Or are you thinking, I don't think I could do that. That's not me. I don't, I, that makes me nervous, the thought of that. Yes, it's the Spirit, but there's also an element that with the Spirit, we are called to have a clear, coherent message in there as well. But in these groups, it also provides ways to have deep theological conversations. I can tell you, the Sunday mornings, I give you the theology that I've studied up this week, but there really isn't any time for conversation, is there? The back and forth, the questions, the answers, and so forth. Because that's not typically how Sunday mornings are designed, but we need that. You don't just grow by consuming things in. But aside from that, it also provides an opportunity to have other pertinent conversations about something that came up this week, and you need some help, guidance, just someone to listen to you. It also provides a mobile network of caretakers. Hey, you know what? I have a need. Something, let me reach out to someone in my group and ask them if they can help me with meeting this need. And we have specifically individuals who are devoted to our prayer. They're praying for us on a daily basis. And then also practicing the spiritual disciplines. Because as the end of Matthew 28 goes, he says he sends them out into the world to do two things. To baptize, one, to baptize them and to teach them to do all that I have commanded. And that's a part of that's the refining. It may be, well, here's what Scripture says. Here's what I'm experiencing in my life. Let's try to work this out. How do these things come together in some way? These are questions that each of us have every week. And the reality is, is that those questions don't get answered on a Sunday morning, each one, because there's just too many of them. So I want to just challenge and encourage you. I will say again what I've already said twice before this body if I had to give up every other ministry in this church, aside from worship, I'd be willing to do it if there was an investment in small groups. Because it has the opportunity to talk about and deal with living out the faith, and it provides a platform for, you may say, well, what about all the caring, all the needs there are? That's why we have deacons, but that's also why we have these groups designed to help with the care and love for one another. So I, I, I deeply encourage you to, to pray over this. You know, during the week or after the service, come talk to me. You know, develop some specific questions you might have or say, what might this look like? Or, hey, maybe it's, you know what, I've heard this. I'm intrigued. Maybe I'm even willing to step out in faith and, and, and try leading something. This is not going to be you have to come up with all the questions on your own. This is going to be kind of guided. So talk with me more about that. I'm done with this for now, but it's really about the one another command and how we can best do that, even in a body of 40, 50, 60 people. We need that. We all need that intimacy that we get in smaller groups. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks for it. And he broke it, and he said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. And in the same way, he took his cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. <laughs> this is my blood. This is Christ's blood shed for you. Drink ye all. So this, this morning, uh, we are going to continue in our series through the Bible, and as you've seen throughout the course of this year, I've been really trying to hit on some of the highlights. I obviously can't touch on anything close to the full gamut of what's here. Those times are in the times in the future years to come that we'll dig more deeply into specific whole books of the scriptures. But today, we turn to something, to, to one, of, one of the things that I imagine, one of the verses that I imagine is is a favorite for many of you. It maybe is one that you have quoted and used quite frequently. It is certainly a favorite in our world. And that is Jeremiah 29, 11. And so we find that in the midst of our text this morning, and I'm going to read, it, to read this text this morning, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what this future and a hope was that God was giving to his people. So if you have your Bible, feel free to look at Jeremiah 29, verse 5, or it's up on the screen. We're going to read through verse 14 this morning. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in numbers there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city in which you have been carried into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declared the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for a hope and a future, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you and will bring you back to the place from which I carry you into exile. Now, if Jeremiah 29, 11 isn't one of those verses that you like to, to use and cling on to for hope, there are no doubt many others. Of those favorite verses that often get displayed on jewelry, for example, or on mugs or on the walls of one's house. Now, oftentimes we hear the verse quoted, but we often fail to neglect the verses around it. We don't think about the context with which that verse was given. And so we may call this biblical cherry picking. Seldom do we often look at the outer context or the greater context. We kind of pass this verse along because, hey, it's, there's a hope and a future for you, regardless of what you're facing. Tell that right now to someone who's in the position like Jeff. It isn't going to go... I mean, they, it's very difficult in the midst of a crisis, if not impossible, to see that hope, and a future.
Now today's scripture passage, the context we're going to really dig into, and that is that I know the plans I have for you. I don't need to even say the rest of you. You probably, most of you, if not all of you, have that verse memorized or close to it. Now we quote these things often with a good intention in mind. We want to encourage people. We want to focus on the future, and we want to give God credit for that. Those are all admirable things. And as I've already said, Jeremiah 29.11 is everywhere. I've, I've seen it on coffee mugs. I've seen it on jewelry. I think we even have it up on our wall in the parsonage. It's everywhere. And yet, despite the popularity, very frequently, this verse is misunderstood and misapplied. And most commonly, we use this as a personal promise. It's as though God gave it to each individual Israelite that this is your personal problem, or per personal promise. And it's a personal promise to each person here. And that God has some work, wonderful and perfect plan in place where things are, your ducks are all going to be in a row and things are just going to be great for each one of you. Many take it out of context and they specifically think that their life is going to be mapped out. You know, they might get a little bump in the road, but yeah, I just, you know, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a faith issue. I need to just work on my faith, and then that's why things are going the way they are. Some people have taken this verse and taken it even further. They say, no, God's promised us all health and wealth. And if you don't have health and wealth, better check your faith at the door. Right? Because God's, and everything, God's giving us a hope and a future, right? It's all about me, 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 which is not to be surprising to a culture that is very centered on me, me, me. I remember being a part of a Bible study years ago, and I remember that the primary question always was, what does this verse mean to me? That was the starting point. That's not a bad question to ask. We want to know the application. But when we start, what does it mean to me? That's problematic. The application of the text is different. The meaning should not be. Now, we may not have come to the right meaning at this point, but that's where context is important. We need to understand that life isn't just this mapped out thing. That, oh, all we got to do is just obey, 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 and it's going to be perfect with no problems. See, the main problem here is that it's me-centered, and that is not the context of this verse. So let's dig into that context now and talk about what Jeremiah 29, 11 is really all about. Does it even mean anything to you? If, 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 if pastor's telling you it, it doesn't, it's not about me, 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 then what does it mean to me? How am I supposed to do with that? What do I feel? How do I answer that question? Context matters. Now, I shared something I learned in seminary way back when I first was preaching here. I think maybe last August. It was a statement, and it's a statement I, I fully believe in. It is, context is king. And what I mean by that is if you don't have the context of anything someone is saying, biblical or not, it is very easy to twist it out of what the meaning was. And so there are three principles. I did not put these on the screen. I should have, but they might be worth jotting down if that is something that would be helpful. There's nothing earth-shattering here, but it might be worth, worth considering. These are three good principles when you are dealing with interpreting Scripture. First, look at the texts, the verses that are immediately surrounding it. Don't just read a verse like Jeremiah 29 11 and claim it as yours as the truth, as this is the way it is, without understanding what's before it, what's after it. Otherwise, you're at extreme danger of plucking it out, cherry-picking it, and misapplying it. Secondly, you must consider who was the original audience. Who was the text to? Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't have application for us, but to try to take something from back in Jeremiah's day, and assume, well, whatever it meant to them clearly, is, or what it apply, how it applied to them is exactly how it applies to me today in the 21st century, is not good, smart thinking, because things are different. And then finally, we must consider 
the full narrative of the Bible. We often run into verses like Jeremiah 29, 11, and we think, well, this is what it means, but we need to step back and think about the scope of all of Scripture. Now, we're not going to address point three very much today, but I'm going to say just one thing about that. When we think about this verse in light of a me-centered, it's all about what this means for me, that is contrary to what the Bible teaches about. It teaches about the need to be selfless, not me-centered. So, before we actually dig into some of these uh, misunderstandings, let's rewind a second. Let's roll back the tape and think about the context with which Jeremiah is speaking. As I've said in the last few weeks, the Israelites have been taken into captivity in Babylon. They are slaves in this land. A few of the most uh, educated and, and wisest individuals end up in places of prominence, but the vast majority of those who are in there have been taken away and they're being used as slaves. Jeremiah, in the verses that I read, is speaking in, there's a void that's been going on. They aren't hearing from God, but these prophets decide to step forward and provide and fill the void. So forget Jeremiah for a second. A bunch of prophets step forward and they think, what is it that people will want to hear? And so they lie to them and they tell them, don't worry, fight back, resist. Your time here will only be a few years. God's going to bring you out of captivity. So you know what? Don't worry about thinking about the future. God's going to turn this thing around here in just a couple, short years. Now imagine for a second, you're dealing with maybe some financial struggles. And if someone gives you, you know what? Don't worry about the long term because God's going to you know, you're going you're gonna to get a bunch of money here in two years. Or you're going to get the finances that you need. Well, if you trust the person, you may say, well, you know what, I'm not going to worry too much. I'm just going to, that, that money's going to come. That promise is going to come there. So they're, they're feeding them what the people want to hear, and the people are eating it up. And so it's in the midst of this lie that Jeremiah steps in. So before I say what he said, let's get to the sermon in a sentence this morning. And that is that God is working out, or God is working in our lives for our ultimate good, which is the salvation of our souls. Now in Jeremiah 29, after the false prophets have been giving their spiel, giving the people what they want to hear, God denounces these false prophets in the harshest language. And through Jeremiah, he says, nope, you guys are going to be around here for 70 years. 70 years. Now, how many people are going to listen to him? Now you understand a little bit, just a portion of why people don't want to listen to him, because that's not what they want to hear. Because how many of them do you think were going to be alive in 70 years? how quick we are to rely upon bad advice. Or how quick are we at times to give bad advice. Why? Because, hey, I'm giving the advice because this is what's helpful now. This maybe is what I think someone needs to hear now, even though it may not be for their best interest. For example, someone's dealing with hurt and pain or a loss of a loved one. To go to someone and say... God works all things for good for those who love him. May not be the appropriate thing you want to extract and give to them in that season. Why? Because it is not, just like this, it is not a personal promise that that's just how life is going to go. There's a principle there. So the people are not listening to Jeremiah, understandably, because they don't want to stay there for seven years. Why? Because, again, none of them... This is what God's saying. None of you will see this promise played out. 
So this is what he said. Listen again to what he said. He said, build and settle, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters and give them for marriage so that they may have sons and daughters. Increase, do not decrease. Live at Live for the peace, seek peace and prosperity of the city. So they're to pray and to seek peace within the people, the very people that did not seek peace with them, that took them out of captivity. But not even that, keep praying for it because as the city prospers, so too will you. Now that's got to be tough news to hear. Right? You're, you're, you've all along been here, we're getting out, we're getting out, I'm going to be here and in, in, I'll be out in five in five years, maybe, and now someone say, nope, sorry, it's 70 years. We want, like, like the Jewish people, we want the quick fix. We want God to just come in there and fix our problems with a snap of a finger, make them vanish quickly. When you see trouble in your life, anything, how quick are you to just wish it, wish it away? Ask God, just take it away right now. Rather than saying, well, what, what am I to learn while I'm in this season? And what's fascinating to me about verse 11, again, as I've already said, is that this promise of a hope and a future is given to a people, none of which would see this promise play out. Don't overlook that point. See, most, most misunderstandings of this verse would have you believe that you know what, if you got a problem today, by next week it'll be fine. Just, God will fix it. God is telling them in the midst of their trials to keep on keeping on. That they must still stay the course. They aren't just to sit around there and complain. They aren't there to just do nothing. They're not there just to wait to be delivered. Which, by the way, sounds a lot like how we're, talk, we're told about the end of the days, the end of the ages. Don't just sit around, do nothing, and complain. And wait for him to return. God wants them to live an abundant life where they are. As they await the future plans that God has for the people. God wants you, right now, regardless of what you are facing, to live an abundant life. Even if the circumstances as you see them are less than ideal. Don't just sit around and do nothing. Get up and act. Move. Move for the gospel. Maybe you're listening to those people. You may not call them false prophets, but this false belief that, you know what, things are just going to fix themselves here shortly. I'll be out of this captivity of cancer or, or some other illness or some other physical ailment that's going on or some financial issue. You know what? It'll just be fine here. That's a tough pill to swallow when we realize that not everything may come as we are led to believe. See, Jeremiah verse 11 of 29 was written to real people in a real time that were going through an incredibly difficult time that none of us here probably can fully understand. It is not a personal promise to each one here in the way that we often misconstrue it. It's a promise that if we follow it, God will lead us it is not, sorry, it is not a promise that God will automatically make you prosper in this life. Because the context here tells us otherwise. Is how do these people that receive the message, they live their whole lives, the rest of their lives as slaves. They died as slaves. They didn't see what we would say is a better life. So it is addressed to a whole group of people, not to the individual. It is a promise that even when things look bleak in your life, God is in control. It's a promise that even though things might not make sense to you right now, you might be saying, God, where are you? Or God, what are you doing? Like, yeah, God, I know you're there, but I have no idea what you're doing. 
or why you're doing this. Why would you allow this to happen? We know that in all of this, God is still good. It is given to a group of people that were struggling to understand what God was doing. And so it's really tempting to want to take this and apply it personally in any situation we face. That, eh, God's promised my hope and a future are good. It'll be good here shortly. It may be in your lifetime and it may not be, depending on what it is that you are faced with. Now, while this verse was not written directly to you, it is written for you. And so you may be saying, well, what is the meaning then? What am I to take away? If I'm not to take this as a, as a personal kind of, this is the way life's going to go. I, just, I need to just have more faith if I'm not getting the results I want. I just somehow have to, to, to believe more. It is a reminder of God's promise and faithfulness and that he is still in control. God was faithful to fulfill his promise with the Israelite people. He did just what he said. After 70 years, they were brought out of captivity. He was faithful. That alone should bring us hope that God will continue to fulfill his promises. And that even in the dark days that you face, or the difficult situations that you find yourself in, we can have hope that God will lead us through those times. It is not a promise that we will be prosperous in this life, that as long as we trust in Jesus enough, that life will just be easy, and that we'll have whatever we want. Now, you may be saying, well, whoever thought that? I can tell you there are many people who walk and step into the faith and then they are not, they don't understand that, and then they find that life is absolutely no different in many ways on the surface. They think, well, this hasn't changed. I'm seeing the same result here. You know, the rain, the, the rain is still falling on me as it was when I was an unbeliever. So what am I to do with this? Is this whole thing a lie? Many people deal with these struggles. You might not be that person. You may say, you know what, Jeremiah 29, 11 isn't one I get hung up on. But there are many others out there. We are called to live a selfless faith that is looking out for the welfare, encouraging one another. I'll tell you what, one thing I will not find, I'm going to give one more pitch for my small group, one thing I will not find today, find out today, nor do I need to, is what you all think about Jeremiah 29, 11. What you think about up here with it, and what you think about it in terms of how you have chosen to live your life. You don't get that opportunity like I do to share what Scripture is saying today, and how that plays out in your life. But you do when you're in environments where you are called to interact with one another, to sharpen one another, to engage the text on a personal level, and ask the question, what do I believe about this text, and how does that play out in the realities of my life? It is a purpose. This verse is a promise that his plan, God's plan for each of us, is good. And in the context of this verse, God's people that he's referring to is the Israelite nation. But we have all been, as Gentiles through belief in Christ, we've been given access to be adopted into the, his family as his children. So this verse still holds true today. So God, so this is not a promise that life will be easy or that we'll get exactly what we want and that things will just be good and that no harm will come and that if harm comes, you better work on your faith a little bit more. You better try a little bit harder, do more things, do the right thing. Really, it's the opposite than that. The promise here is that in this context, we will, have, we will have troubles. We will have troubles in this life. Jesus told us that. The thing is, just like the Israelites, we don't want to listen to that. 
We want to just hear the stuff that says things are going to be easier, things are going to get better, things are going to be smooth. They want, we, just like them, we want to listen to the quote-unquote false prophets of the day. And that just may be the lies that are going through our mind or what we hear from other people that, well, this is what Scripture says. A good first question is, does it? Have you done your due diligence to decide whether or not what someone says to you or what you read on the internet is true? Biblical? This is no small concern. It's interesting. We had a topic in Sunday school, a different issue, and we talked about it was a secondary issue. It is not a salvation issue per se, but what's interesting is that many times it's the secondary issues that divide believers and also a, a misunderstanding of some of the secondary issues that lead people to leave the faith. Because they said, well, this is what it said, this is what I'm reading that it says, and this isn't happening. So what's going on here? What's the disconnect? So these things do matter. Because I have seen, personally, I've seen people whose faith life has been tipped, flipped upside down. They've been angry at God because, well, God, this is what you told me. You told me. That my life was going to be hopeful and future. there's going to be a great future and there wouldn't be, you wouldn't harm me. But how do I reconcile that with what's going on in my life right now? Some of you, again, may be saying, I've dealt with hardship and that hasn't, that hasn't made me lose the anchor of my faith. But that doesn't mean that it's not out there. And it may not be 29.11 from Jeremiah for you, but it might be something else. So it is not a small concern. They spend their entire life trying to figure out, I just, you know, how, do I, how do I get more faith? You know, your life just seems to be going really smoothly. Tell me the secret. What is it that you have going for you? Why is it that God is blessing, blessing you over here when in reality, if we dug into the depths of what's going on in each another's life, we'd realize there's a lot of negative stuff things, trials that we're all enduring. So there are a lot of potential repercussions for how one should perceive their life. So we need to handle things like this text very carefully. See, verse 11 is telling us this, that while life will get incredibly tough at times, God is still in control. And while the difficult season you are in might not end tomorrow, it might not end next week or next month or next year, it might not ever end this side of eternity. God is still there. And hear this part. He is still bringing his people through it. He is looking for our good. He isn't looking for our good the way we want to do it, or the good we think we want. He's looking for our good. And what is our good? My sermon in a sentence said it. Our ultimate good is for the salvation of our souls. So what is the ultimate purpose for the sin, or for the, the difficult times in your life? This question has been stumping people over the generations. And I, I liken it this way. There's one common thread to this question that you'll most likely hear it said. It's why does God, why would a loving God allow suffering in this life? And we're not going to go down that rabbit trail today because that we could be here for another hour or two. But I will say this, that when we are in the midst of the battles of this life, and I include each of us, myself included, we are more apt to make crazy, irrational decisions when we are in the stress of the battles. We do things that make absolutely no sense. We would even see that they make no sense if we could see it looking back and saying, what were in the world were we thinking there? Why in the world did we do that? 
The, and, and many times I've heard people say, the only way I got through it is because my eyes were fixed on Jesus. And they may even finish by saying, I don't know what people do, how they survive or get through this if they don't know Christ. I hear that all the time. And it's true. We want things resolved now. We want things to be fixed like every sitcom that you've ever watched where in 30 minutes or less, everything is back to normal and everything's just hunky-dory. But God has bigger fish to fry rather than just to patch over something that needs to be changed. God has a bigger objective in mind for your life. So we best understand that God's plans will come to fruition. That's how we will understand them when we are seeing things as Christ did. So in that passage, we read about we understand God's will more when we are following and seeking him with all of our heart. We begin to realize it isn't about me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 is a good parallel verse here. It's where Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet heavenly, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than them? This verse, these two verses here have direct meaning to verse 11 in Jeremiah. It isn't a promise where nothing is going to happen in our life that we have to worry about. Things are going to happen every day where you think, okay, how do I address this? I've got to think about this, this, and this. I've got to worry about what might happen. You know, what might happen to my, my kids when they go off to college? I mean, that's a long time ago. But between them, what about, what about when they meet friends and they start interacting with people who don't share the same values? I mean, you can dig into all sorts of things that we as parents, as friends, as neighbors, that can, can be worrisome. But it is a promise that in the midst of these worrisome problems, we can have peace. Because God is in control, even when things don't make sense. God has promised to be with us, and that we can find peace and rest in Him. Brothers and sisters, the gospel message is not an easy life message. There is this thing about dying to oneself and having to carry the cross daily. It isn't an easy life, but it's a promise of the hope that God will help us because, and he already has helped us by overcoming death with his payment at the cross. We all know it. I'm not speaking to anybody that doesn't know this, but we are going to continue to experience obstacles, and you're going to continue to go through the trials in life. There's nothing I can do, there's nothing no one else in this room can do to remove that from you. Those things are going to happen. But when you find those, yourself in those situations, or when you see others in those situations, I encourage you to take and to give the advice, I'm praying for you, I'm here with you, don't give up. God has been faithful in your life. God will continue to be faithful in your life. And I want you to know that I'm going to be right here along the journey so that when you need, if you need that something, you bring it to me. If you need encouragement, I will be here to encourage you. I'm not going to give you false platitudes that things that you might want to hear that might sound good, that might make me feel better, if I'm not willing to stick around and be invested in the life of those who are enduring it. God has a plan for each of us, and we all know, and we all don't like the fact that oftentimes it isn't on our timing. We want things done and fixed and resolved. But when you find it, pray and ask God to reveal his plan for you, to reveal more and more of his word and his son to you, and seek him with all of your hearts. Then and only then will you have an understanding 
of who Christ is and how he's going to bring us out of our captive state. Because, brothers and sisters, we have all been in a captive state. We were all captive to the philosophies of this world, to the sins of this world. We are to move beyond that and to not be taken hold of those things. Finally, God does, regardless of what you think or feel right now, you may be feeling down in the dirt, maybe not because of my message, hopefully not because of my message, but just because of what life has given you. God does desire for you to live an abundant life here on this earth. But his true plans, the plans that we really see being laid out in verse 11 here, are for the next life. That's when they will be realized. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we, we thank you for verses like Jeremiah 29, 11. Lord, you have given us through your word an understanding, just as you did to the Israelite people, that, that you do have our best interest in mind. And Lord, we acknowledge that we are temporal and that we are short-sighted and that we are often looking for the things that will benefit us here and now and that we are too quick to discount the value of you and anything that you are doing if we don't see those results immediately. Lord, teach us to have a mindset that says, Lord, regardless of what we face, regardless of what we are enduring, even within this country, Lord, to be faithful to you, to not sit around and just spend all of our days complaining or not knowing what to do, being bitter about life's circumstances or even trying to predict what's going to come. Lord, we know what's going to come. We know trials and tribulations are coming. And they are even to this, even at this point, they are parts of our reality. Lord, we also know, as I said last week, that you ultimately win. Lord, we know that that is the ultimate good that you have for each of us who love you and seek after you with all our hearts. So, Lord, when we endure these trials, I pray for a spirit of, God, what are you trying to teach me right now? Lord, how can I use the way that you have led me through trials in the past to help me reconcile and deal with and, and even... Find a, a small way to even enjoy some of the trials that are to come. Lord, how can we use the benefits of the trials with which we face in the way that we are present with others who are now facing similar trials? Lord, we are here as one body. Lord, we are here because you have called us to be here, to be loving one another, and all of those one another things that you have commanded us to do in Scripture. Lord, help us to never look lightly on your words. To not simply just take a meaning for a text because that is what gets passed along to us in any source we look, but to consider the context. Lord, we thank you for your word, a word that is, that is made clear to those who honestly discern and seek your, the knowledge that you willingly provide to us and yet complex enough that requires us to take our focus off of the world, off of the world, and to really devote ourselves to studying and meditating on it. We thank you for the gift of your Son, for what he did for us on the cross, and in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction, and there will be a closing song. Now in, it, now in him who is able to strengthen... According to, my, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed through the prophetic writings that have been made known to all the nations, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about obedience of faith to the only wise God and be his glory now and forevermore. Amen. Remember, church, you leave this place and are sent into your mission field.